I'm Meredith Blackwell and I'm at the International Mycological Congress number 11 at, in, in San Juan, Puerto Rico at the Convention Center. And I'm going to talk here to Nina who will introduce herself. So I'm Nina Gunte Zimmermann. I come from Slovenia, from Ljubljana, actually from the University of Ljubljana. And I'm also going to talk about fungi, I guess. Good. Yes, yes. And just as an aside, my my father, my my son-in-law is Slovenian. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, that did Several happen. Several generations. Uh, okay. The name is B A J O. Do you know that name? B A J O. It's the name Oh, yeah. B A J O. They call it. Okay. Yeah. But that's actually quite difficult because Slovenians we are only two millions, so yeah. you are actually in a very exquisite club to get somebody Slovenian in the family. Mm -hmm. So my granddaughter is half Slovenian. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, why don't you tell me about where you grew up? And was it it was always in Slovenia that you grew? Well, I, I was born in Ljubljana. Mm -hmm. I was born in Slovenia. But when I was eight years old, my parents decided to go to Libya, out of all places. Oh. And I was going for to an Italian school for four years. Nobody asked me if I wanted or not. They just put me in this school. So first it was Italian school, then for a short while it was an American school because, you know, the revolution happened, mm -hmm. Gaddafi came, then we went back to Slovenia. So I had a bit of a mm -hmm. childhood, I can say. Yeah. And after that... How old were you when you went back? When I went Slovenia. back, something like uh, 13 years. Mm -hmm. And then I slowly entered high school in Ljubljana, went to biology. So I studied biology and at the same time I wanted to study architecture, languages, philosophy. So it was totally a matter of coincidence that I ended up in biology. Uh, not one of those that knew from the cradle on what, wanted, what I would exactly. want to do. So then I, when I finished biology I had to do my undergraduate thesis and I got a position at the National Institute of Chemistry at that time and actually for uh, studying gamma mutations in Aspergillus niger to, for, to get a better production of cellulases. It was a project that was at uh, that time financed by International Atomic Energy Agency and I thought it was very fancy. Anyway, I was really happy because based on these results that I obtained, uh, we published an article which was recognized and it was only my undergraduate thesis, so wow. I was really happy. Somehow, because of that, when I finished my school, or when I finished university, they offered me a position there, so to go and have a master degree. So I did have a master degree at the National Institute of Chemistry, and at that time, we were in Yugoslavia. Slovenia at that time was part of Yugoslavia. A socialistic country, not that close as, for example, Eastern Europe and so on, but mainly not closed in the sense that you couldn't travel, but closed particularly because we didn't have much money. So at that time there was an opportunity, and the opportunity was that one could apply for a USDA scholarship. So it was given by the research center, the USDA research center in New Orleans. And for the entire Yugoslavia, which was 22 million people, they actually offered two positions. Wow. I did Both apply. In New Orleans? Yeah, the one in New Orleans. I did apply, and I was extremely lucky because what they looked for, and I didn't know that in advance, was actually that somebody would really have quite a reasonable um, knowledge of English, which at that time in Yugoslavia was not that no. common. But since I lived in Libya, and you know, had some experience with the American school, I did really quite well. Not because I was smart or anything, I just spoke a little bit better. So luck. <laughs> yeah, so one of these two scholarship, scholarships uh, went to me, and I ended up in New Orleans, and I did my master degree there. Yeah, well, one, I defended one, it at home in Ljubljana, but I did okay. the experimental yeah, part okay. there. Yeah. So it was through the university? The yeah, UPR. so I defended it there, and I had a totally wonderful time. You can imagine a student from did Yugoslavia. Did you go to the French Quarter much? If I did what? French Quarter. Did yeah, you go of the course French I did. I went to the French Quarter, I went to listen to jazz, so I was like 10, 10 hours per day in the lab and then time off. So I slept very little in short. That was not something I did much. It's one of my favorite cities. It's a wonderful city yeah. and 
I do remember it, of course, like it was before Katrina, because I haven't been after Katrina happened. So my, I have really these beautiful memories of New Orleans. But I think they're bringing it back as they did here. Um, yeah. After hurricanes, they try to get it working fast. Yeah. So it would be nice mm -hmm. to go. I would like to go, yeah. but yeah, there has to be an opportunity. Yeah. Now, uh, Slovenia is, uh, is that where the Dalmatian coast was? Yeah, it was Slovenia borders on one side to Italy, mm -hmm. then to Hungary, and then to Croatia, mm -hmm. and Croatia has the Dalmatian oh, coast. Oh, Croatia yeah. does. Yes, I had a but very good friend who was Slo Slovak. Yeah, so um, Slovenians, we traditionally go for our summer holidays, we go to Dalmatia. Yeah. So this is what we do. We go to their islands, they're really beautiful. So yeah, we also did a lot of that. Yeah, I had a um, third friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He painted pictures of some of the cities on the Dalmatian coast. So, yeah. yeah. So um, now what do you do? Well, maybe I just should say that then I made oh, yeah, my, my, my PhD, PhD. so that. I did my PhD also at the mm -hmm. National Institute of Chemistry and at that time the, the theme was um, finding a replacement organism and fungus for the statins which are being which were patented and being produced mm -hmm. by Aspergillus stereos. Right. So Merck had a patent on that and this Yugoslav Slovenian pharmaceutical company wanted to find another producer. Mm -hmm. At that time, um, once going through the market, you know, the food market in Ljubljana, I saw all these mushrooms being sold and I thought, why wouldn't one look in the Chinese pharmacopoeia? Because as in Europe, we have this tradition of these herbs that have uh, medical effects. Yeah. We all know that Chinese, Japanese have this kind of tradition. So I got somewhere some kind of pharmacopoeia and I studied it. And I discovered that for Pleurotus ostreatus, the oyster mushroom, it was actually this written that it has these effects, anti-cholesterolemic mm -hmm. and so on. So, well, anyway, my PhD was then to prove that uh, oyster mushrooms and other pleurotus, not only the ostreatus, yeah. do produce all of them statins. Yeah. And it's a very good source of, uh, well, lowering your cholesterol. You just dry the mushroom, put one spoon of something in your yogurt, I mean, of it in your yogurt, it's much better than taking the pills. So you can actually eat it? You can actually eat it and you get the same effect, mm -hmm. and it's a kind of synergistic effect. So, of course, the, it, the PhD was not that simple, but we identified the substance and uh, did the fermentation and discovered how it moves from the mushroom into the spores and all sort of things and it was nicely published and the company made a patent on that so that was how my PhD. Yeah, I've actually heard there are a number of fungi that produce statins, some of which are commercial now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But terrius is a, a fungus I once saw found in hay. It was mm -hmm. all over the, the hay, damp hay, that a horse had been fed. Yeah. And the horse died. So, too much of a good thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're they're well, other toxins. Terios is not what you want, but oyster mushrooms are quite nice. <laughs> yeah, that might be but a good thing. In, via the oyster mushroom, we actually come to what became my, my subject when it comes to my research. Because I told you that this Slovenian pharmaceutical company made a patent, an international patent. But after they made this patent, nothing happened. All sort of people approached us, you know, whether we should be open a spin-off and things like that. But the pharmaceutical company was like, they didn't want to say anything. Mm -hmm. And eventually I discovered that what they wanted with this PhD of mine was to have a kind of smoke screen. In reality, they wanted to produce by the technology which was owned by Merck. So they just needed something to wave so nobody would pay attention to what they, in reality mm -hmm. they were doing. And since I was young and idealistic and uh, took things very seriously, I was so disappointed that I decided, okay, now I want to have a theme that is going to be totally mine and totally new and totally away from all this kind of industrial interests. And at that time, uh, I was aware, it was a fashion in microbiology, I can say, that bacteriologists are crazily finding all sort of interesting bacteria and archaea in extreme environments. And I thought, okay, which extreme environment do we have in Slovenia? And realized that we have these beautiful saltarans which originate from Roman times, so they're 2,000 years old. Mm -hmm. 
and that also known that in the 16th century uh, microbial, microbial mat has been introduced from Dalbatia that you mentioned before from an island in this uh, Salterans and because of that what the soil they produce in these Salterans is totally white and pure because no mixing occurs from the mud beneath and you know the crystallization of salt up. And then the next thought was is anybody doing fungi in extreme mm -hmm. environments? Does anybody has ever looked in fungi in the Salterans? And it turned out that the only knowledge we have at that time, that was around 2000, is that fang fungi can contaminate food preserved with, with lots of salt, but absolutely nothing from nature. So I started working in these salterans. And to cut the story short, not to make this interview too long, we did indeed discover that certain groups of fungi do grow extremely happily in the Salterans. First we found them in Slovenia, then on a global scale, and then they're adapted to the Salterans on all sorts of molecular levels that we have been st studying ever since. So my career of uh, mycologist specialized on extreme fungi started due to a disappointment that was turned in a good way oh, in the local Salterans. <laughs> Yeah. So, so tell me which fungi in particular yeah. are in the salt. So in particular, the, the fungi that do best are the black yeast. Mm -hmm. And there's one which is all over the world the dominant one. And that it belongs to Capnodialis. It's called Cortia vernecii. Mm -hmm. And that's the only organism, bacteria included, that can grow throughout the entire salinity range, which means without salt, and up to 32% of salt, wow. which is precipitation sea level. No, seawater has two. No, seawater has two to three percent. Here oh. we are talking ten to twelve times oh, more. Okay, percent. I'm, I'm yeah. thinking yeah. about that. So this one is like I said, no bacteria is known to be able to that zero to 32, and it has a very broad optimum around five to ten, and it's a perfect model for studying molecular adaptations. So we've been studying its population dynamics, genomics, molecular adaptations, biotechnological potential, enzymes, name it. So this is the main one, but it's not the only one. Then you also have other black yeasts, which are less frequent, but still, like um, Trimatostroma, Pheoteca. And there's quite a lot of Cladosporia. So the number of them. Maybe you know the Cladosporium halotolerance is one of the most known Cladosporium. So that one was first discovered in the Salterans. Mm -hmm. So it, ca it comes from there. Now it's all around the world. And then also some white and yet, uh, red yeasts, like for example, uh, Rhodotorula mm -hmm. is, is also present. And then the interesting thing for me is that you don't find marine fungi in the Salterans. Mar for marine, this is absolutely too extreme. Oh, so okay. these fungi that I said are really specialized for mm -hmm. these hypersalad environments. And then, well, the story continues to another extreme environment. And this other extreme environment that we are studying is the Arctics, Arctic glaciers. Because, you know, while, while working with these halophilic fungi, we made the realization that it's all about low water activity. So if there's a lot of salt, it binds water. So the organisms live in an environment which is low in water. Mm -hmm. And when you have ice in the glaciers, well, water freezes, and when it freezes, it lowers it's the water activity. Yeah. But at the same time, it also creates uh, channels around individual ice crystals, which are full of brine, which are actually brine channels. Mm -hmm. So it's a very similar environment to the Salterans after you think about it. It was not known. So in um, some years after the discovery of this funk in the Salterans, we very bravely, you still have to have it in mind that I come from the part of the world where we, maybe it's less privileged in that way, applied for a European project, uh, which allowed you to do work in uh, Arctic, in Svalbard, based on this hypothesis that I just explained. Nobody has done it before. and. I, and we got it, and I went to Svalbard. I was extremely happy. I was the first Slovenian ever. Woman, <laughs> it didn't matter. A woman Slovenian. <laughs> yeah. I was totally happy. 
But the main idea at that time was to look uh, for the fungi in sea ice. But global warming was already plague, I can say, because that time when I came, there was no sea ice. It simply was already melted. What month was it? Yeah, that was May, and mm -hmm. it was already gone. And I was so frustrated because I had these three weeks and what to do, you know, what mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do. But out of frustration, I went, I, there was a very nice British guy in this station who was kind of fun. And out of frustration, to, to release my frustration, he helped me. And we went with the boat and we collected pieces of glacial ice that were floating in the sea. And then I started to melt this glacial ice in the lab. And to my huge surprise, it was full of algae. I mean, full. You know, we are talking 10 to the, five, to the fifth per milliliter. All dark, all dark. No, mainly Cryptococcus rhodotorula, mm -hmm. but if you had ice with gypsum inclusions, which is something that you also find in the solterans, then it was all black. Mm -hmm. Well, first, you know, the, the blind chicken syndrome. Eh? So first you get the results, then you find the hypothesis. was yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we had, how is that possible, really? How could that happen? Anyway. After quite some time, we realized that we probably, by chance, discovered the populations which are formed in the so-called subglacial environment. So if you have a glacier, you have the ground below, the permafrost below, and then you have this mass of ice on top of it. And when this mass is uh, heavy enough, it presses on this ground and creates a very thin biofilm of water. So whatever falls like snow on top of the glacier, then travels layer by layer by layer by layer until it reaches the bottom mm -hmm. where the liquid water is and whatever survived gets enriched there. So this passage can be 50,000 years. But then if, if it survives, then these populations of yeasts are created, I can say it like that. Yeah. So then after we got this hypothesis, we systematically sampled and so on and now we know this is like that so we are sure about this and this is our second group of organisms that we are studying and of course it's a very interesting phenomenon because with this global warming these big pieces of glaciers are you know falling off and melting yeah. and all these biomasses go into the oceans and they travel around the world in the bottom of the oceans. I mean, all this nitrogen on one hand and also all this diversity that nobody really knew before. So it's quite a phenomenon. It's, it's a very interesting system to study and we go on doing it. Are they different, distinctive species? They are distinctive species. We have a very, um, I mean, it, the diversity is quite high. But the dominant species are not that many. So it's like I said, several species of Cryptococcus, Rhodosporidium, Rhodotorula, Black East, Aurobasidium in particular, and some more. These are the core group. Mm -hmm. And then you have a lot of this, you know, kind of small yeah. sporadic variety that is interesting, but not from the perspective we want, because we like to study the molecular mechanisms. So we studied a lot about the um, cold adaptation, like on the fluidity of membranes, on the level of compatible solutes, cell wall, polysaccharides, which are formed, all these things. And um, so this is our second big environment. And then comes a third one. <laughs> Another extreme environment. Another extreme environment, which is totally different. And again, it comes in a way from a frustration. I guess this is a kind of repeating uh, yeah, motive. Frustration <laughs> leads to discovery. And in this case, mm -hmm. I was at home, sick, the flu. And when I got well enough, you know, to not have to stay in bed, I kind of could circulate around the apartment and be impatient. I once stood in front of my dishwasher at home. <laughs> And I looked at this dishwasher and I said, hmm, this is a domestic extreme environment. It has either lots of water or nothing. It has pH up to 12 due to detergents, oxidative stress, and temperatures, you know, 60, 70 degrees. So this is really an extreme environment. So I sampled, brought it to the lab, and one week later I got my assistant, uh, my colleague, 
came to me completely white in her face and I said, Nina, you know what you have in your dishwasher? I said, no, I mean, I'm not a perfect mm -hmm. housewife, but well, <laughs> what do I have? <laughs> and she told me I have like a huge amount of a black yeast, again black yeast, Exophiala dermatitis. Exophiala dermatitis is a very nasty human opportunistic pathogen that we don't know actually anything about it when it comes to its natural sources. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are few isolates in the entire world coming from some berries in the tropics, but maybe 10 isolates. When we're dishwashers and then it. <laughs> yeah, and the, it looks like all the other isolates that existed at that time came from patients. And they, this exophiala dermatitis is very frequent with cystic fibrosis patients, 20% of them in Sweden have it. It goes into the brain. It creates cutaneous, uh, I mean, cutaneous, subcutaneous infections, lungs, all sort of things. Were you able to do a study to see if it was mostly women or people who had dishwashers? No, no, it was not no, that I, simple. Anyway, no. so wanted to say that then we, we I really got worried, mm -hmm. and uh, then we looked a little bit, and we saw that in the other literature, they only associated exophiala so far with a little bit with sinks in bathrooms, a little bit with showers, such things, but not high numbers. We had 10 to the 6 cells per square centimeter, mm -hmm. so of the rubber seal where we isolated. Okay, so like I said, I know I'm not perfect, far from that, so I asked my colleagues to do the same sampling, and all the dishwashers had the same results. Then we asked students, because they work at the university, and they brought samples from all Slovenia. 70% of dishwashers were fungal, and 50% of all isolates were this exophiala dermatitis. Then followed colleagues around the world, so we got many samples. And to make it sure, 50-60% of all dishwashers globally are infected, and the interesting thing is, it doesn't matter if you sample in the Arctic, in the tropic, everywhere you have the same five species. And the dominant one is Exophiala dermatitis. The other four are also all opportunistic pathogens. So it seems the selective pressure in dishwasher is so strong that unregarding which water, which food, which person, you get the same, the same fungi. Yeah. Yeah. So this was one of these stories that happened sometimes, they were totally viral. So Yellow Press mm -hmm. took it and, uh, yeah. Well, let me tell you about that. <laughs> <coughs> uh, three years ago, I was on a fellowship at Harvard and I had to give a talk. Mm -hmm. And so my talk was about fungi everywhere and fungi for all the people that were in the program because many of them weren't even biologists. But everybody practically had a dishwasher. Yeah. And at the same time, there was this horrible outbreak of all sorts of meningitis caused by, by your organism. Mm -hmm. And in Boston, there was a, a pharmaceutical company there. Yeah. You remember this? Yeah, I remember that, yeah. And mm -hmm. so anyway, I was talking about that because the trial was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to show the picture of the dishwasher. <laughs> okay. So it worked out because of you. Okay, I didn't even I'm glad. I'm glad. I I glad I, I contributed something. <laughs> but when you asked me um, whether we could prove that, for example, we people that are using dishwashers have these infections, mm -hmm. no, because it was extremely hard to come to any agreement with medical doctors, I must yeah. say. It, they are a bit of a hard population to talk to, was my kind of conclusion. So I kind of left this part, mm -hmm. you can't do everything. But then we, we mainly focused on um, seeing how from the dishwashers this exophiala dermatitis gets spread into the environment. And we learned many things. So now we know, for example, that kitchens with dishwashers have a totally different microbiome than kitchens without dishwashers. So if you have dishwashers, you have high diversity of fungi mm -hmm. and you have this black yeast everywhere. I mean, on all the surfaces. If you don't have a dishwasher, I'm not saying that that's much better, but then you have candida parapsilosis everywhere. So 
<laughs> I've always heard it's better to have a dishwasher and use high temperature to scald the dishes. Exactly, the yeah. I, I use it. <coughs> but I just use it at the highest temperature. I don't follow much these mm -hmm. um, ecological suggestions because mm -hmm. If you use what they tell us, you know, degrees, 40 degrees, which is very ecological, and we all know our body temperature 37, I mean, you actually, each time you press that button, you make a selection for mm -hmm. pathogens. So yeah. you enrich them in your environment. Mm -hmm. And the same happens in the washing machines, by the way. We, we also study that, so the same thing. So has this given you any ideas about where to look in nature? Yeah, well, the next thing, the, the, the newest thing we are doing, oh, you mean for Exofiala? Uh -huh. Now, we thought a lot, but the places we had in mind, it, so far we didn't yet find it. No, I and actually... it may be that there's so many organisms in those we, habitats, they compete, and it's Yeah, pro, it's very well. slow growing under mm -hmm. these kind of conditions, but we did find it in Arctic glaciers, to my surprise. Wow. Yeah, so it seems it actually can fall with the snow on the glaciers, and we also saw it in the water coming from the glaciers, and it's also in tap water, by the way, but in small numbers. Mm -hmm. But when it gets into dishwasher, it gets enriched. But what would be the natural reservoir? These numbers that we got around are too little, that I could say, that we know. We, in that way, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe only one of those really kind of domesticated fungi, it's, you know, mm -hmm. they're quite some yeah. after all. Yeah, what its closest relatives? Uh, well, it's, that's been worked out, I'm sure. Somebody's it, done the phylogeny. Yeah, yeah, yes. Exophialis, they also belong to Discaptodialis. So mm -hmm. they, uh, uh, sorry, Keto, they belong to the Ketotirialis. Mm -hmm. So they are actually related to rock inhabiting mm -hmm. fungi. So that seems to be the yeah. closest. Yeah. But there are quite many Exophialis. They are known for their ability to be pathogens also on fish, for mm -hmm. example, on amphibians. They are known for its ability to degrade aromatic hydrocarbons, so it's an interesting group of fungi that, yeah. So they're not all high temperature? No, they're not. They, you have the high temperature ones and the cold and temperature the, ones, yeah. Interesting. Very nice. Yeah. So then the next thing, the last thing that we are very excited about number now. Number five. <laughs> Sorry? Number five. <laughs> yeah. Is, um, again, are we... Well, throughout my professional career, I was in a way competing a little bit with bacteriologists because they think they have the monopoly when it comes to extremes, like fungi can do it. And this case is the same. We are talking about Greenland, which is becoming more and more black. About Southwest Greenland is black because of this, black blo uh, this bloom of black ice algae. It's something that we know only for the last five years. And due to this ice algae, which have a particular pigment, purpuragalin, it's called, that covers the chlorophyll, the ice is getting melted much, much faster than if it would be nice and white. So it's really accelerated the melting. And all this water now, of course, goes into these crevices, goes to the bottom, to the permafrost, and uh, stimulates the methanogenic arc action of the archaea. So more methane is being produced, which generates more melting. So it, it's really totally accelerated. And uh, with this phenomenon, uh, now a uh, European project is dealing, which is called Black and Blue. It's led by a British group. You heard? I've heard it. Yeah. And they didn't have in their consortium nobody to look into the fungal part. Only chemists, bacteriologists, that was it. And somehow I kind of <laughs> managed to convince them <laughs> that it would be a good idea to look for the fungal part because they were sure there's nothing. Yeah. So only last year, in 2017, we were able to send our student, my, my student, Italian, very nice Italian girl, so she could join the expedition and go with them, and she sampled for the first time for fungi. And in short, there are absolutely really many. More important than anything else? Well, there are really, really many, only from this black ice, mm -hmm. because we sample black ice, clear ice, supraglacial water, and these cryoconite holes. Only from here we got already 35 genera, not, mm -hmm. not species. So genera, and we did the cultivation and also the NGS, next generation sequencing analysis. And since this was sampled only last year, 
we are of course working on that. So we, there's plenty to work on. These are the first results now coming up. But what I was really so surprised was that I saw there's a number of pathogenic fungi there and the number of endophytic fungi that nobody thought would be associated with this algae. Mm -hmm. I should also say that experimentation with this algae is very difficult because they are not cultivable at the moment. Nobody knows how to cultivate them. So everything you have to do is fresh biomass, which then dies off. Yeah. And then you have to go back again if you're lucky, mm -hmm. which is not that cheap, and get new, new biomass. So this is a totally new world of extremophiles that we are just discovering and I guess in about one year I'll be able to say something more meaningful from what I just said. Well, it's pretty exciting so far. <laughs> no, that is really so, interesting. Yeah, this is really what we are really excited about. And just maybe to make a little connection to the extreme domestic environment, it's quite funny. Another appliance that we are looking is refrigerators. We haven't published that yet. But when we look in the refrigerators, uh, not anything related to food, just the plastic part and where you have this um, condensation, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. What we find there is in 35% of the cases, it's Arctic fungi. Fungi that so far have been found only in the Arctic and not elsewhere. So they have a home away from home in our refrigerators. Right. So, <laughs> so do they get from north to south and south to north? Talking about <coughs> endemitism, yeah, well, this is also, we, we are doing some initial work on this level because we are doing also some genomics. So we are comparing Arctic and Antarctic strains of the same with, species. With refrigerator stepping stones. Which, exactly, yeah. So we, we are starting now this and mm -hmm. we will see if we have, Very if they're different, if they're the same, if it's yeah. just kind of um, ability to be dynamic. Mm -hmm. It remains and to be seen. I guess some of them could be carried in the Yeah, currency. actually little is known about that. Mm -hmm. It's also when you start working on this, you discover how little we yeah. know about this, yeah. how they get transported over these huge distances, mm -hmm. because we're talking from one pole to the other. Right. So there was a, uh, I got my start in mycology because uh, Dr. Alexopoulos needed someone to look at an airborne fungus project mm -hmm. he was working on. Not that I ever knew anything about it because I'd been studying fish, yeah. but <laughs> I, I was supposed to look and see what I could grow out of slides and been exposed to the air pretty high up. Yeah. yeah. Interesting work. Yeah, well, it's something we should do more, mm -hmm. altogether more of that because, like I said, we, it would also help to explain some endemic questions. But on the other hand, as I mentioned before, now that we know that these glaciers are melting and, uh, well, these psychotolerant organisms then get released in the water and if they travel with currents and so on mm -hmm. on the bottom of the oceans where the temperature is, Slow. you know, below five degrees, mm -hmm. they can infect rich the other pole without any major problem, yeah, I would say, they if they are helped with the currents. Yeah. So it's something which nobody, as far as I know, has looked into it, and it would be really interesting to, to do it. Well, I like very much the, the interest in your house, and then it applies to nature too. That's yeah. very, very interesting. Well, we like but this combination. It's kind of, it puts you in another frame mm -hmm. of thinking, right. so that you look around yourself in, in, in a different way, simply yeah. like your environment. Well, this has been very interesting. Thank you so much for coming and being interviewed. It was your students who were pushing this, and yeah. I thought they wanted to be interviewed. Oh, no, 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 not us, <laughs> not us. And they went and got you, so I'm oh, really okay. glad that you came back. So thank you for the invitation.